is Susie Bash. I'm a neuroradiologist at RadNet, and today we're going to talk about the state of artificial intelligence in imaging. Disclosures include some advisory work for Cortex and Icometrics. Let's first take a look at a market update and trends of artificial intelligence in radiology. There are a broad range of AI applications in the imaging space, which have the potential to positively impact quality, efficiency, and diagnostic capabilities. However, it's very important to have clinical trials to validate the claims of these FDA-cleared AI products before incorporating them into our clinical practice. Ideal AI products save us time and enhance quality with seamless workflow integration. Particularly appealing products are vendor neutral and can improve over time with deep learning. So what is deep learning? Deep learning can be thought of as the deepest subset of artificial intelligence. AI is any computer method that performs tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Machine learning is one type of AI that uses algorithms that enable computers to learn from existing data without explicit programming. Machine learning methods can further be subdivided into unsupervised and supervised learning. For unsupervised learning, the computer itself must determine the classes of images. In supervised learning, some ground truth exists, which is used to train the algorithm. Deep learning is a supervised learning method that uses some form of neural networks. Deep learning algorithms can be paired with techniques such as compressed sensing to significantly reduce image acquisition time, or alternatively, it can also increase image quality. Some of the greatest benefits of AI tools developed with DL reconstruction is superior image quality, higher perceived signal to noise ratio, higher perceived contrast to noise ratio, reduced truncation artifact, higher perceived spatial resolution, or alternatively, it's possible to greatly accelerate image acquisition speed while using DL reconstruction to maintain image quality. One of the best advantages of developing an AI tool with deep learning reconstruction is that the DL algorithm will continue to improve with additional data. AI tools can be applied before, during, or after image acquisition. For example, before image acquisition, AI tools can aid in scheduling, insurance authorization, billing, and mining packs and medical records for key clinical information. During image acquisition, AI tools can help by standardizing head angulation, correcting for patient motion, reducing noise and artifacts, decreasing scan time, reducing dose, improving protocols, and increasing image quality. After image acquisition, AI triage tools can identify and flag critical imaging findings and then prioritize those cases to the top of the work list so they can be attended to quickly. They can also improve interpretation efficiency and accuracy, and they can improve clinical diagnostic value of a study, such as through quantitative volumetric MRI. So let's take a look at AI tools that can be applied during image acquisition at the image reconstruction phase. This is where we can see the interplay between enhanced image quality and accelerated acquisition speed. A company that stands out as a leader in the image reconstruction space is Subtle Medical. Subtle has three products, Subtle Pet, Subtle MR, and Subtle GAD. Subtle Pet and Subtle MR are the first FDA-cleared products to market, which use deep learning AI solutions for medical imaging enhancement, while integrating seamlessly with any PET or MRI scanner, without any significant alteration in the existing workflow. Imaging centers and hospitals have used Subtle PET to enable up to four times faster scans. Safer exams are achieved by using reduced radio tracer dose combined with their proprietary deep learning algorithms, resulting in clinically equivalent images to the ground truth. Subtle MR leads the market with its technology for super resolution which allows for flexibility in enhancing the images where denoising may not be possible. Subtle GAD is still in the research phase. Subtle just received an NIH grant for $1.6 million to continue their research on lowering gadolinium dose in contrast-enhanced MRIs. Research has shown that with their AI, they can achieve 90% gadolinium dose reduction while still preserving the same diagnostic image quality. These are an example of the significant gains in image quality with subtle deep learning enhancement. The images on the left are standard of care and the images on the right are subtle enhanced for both the subtle PET and subtle MR products. So how does subtle PET work? Subtle PET uses deep learning algorithms developed through training on robust paired data sets 
of standard pet acquisitions and fast pet acquisitions. The data sets included a wide range of clinical indications, patient cohorts, vendors, and scanner models. The software is compatible with any model of pet scanner or any PAC system. SubtlePet is the first and only FDA-cleared AI solution for enhancement of pet imaging. Unlike the OEMs, Subtle's advantage is that it works on any brand of scanner, so you're not bound to a single vendor. In this example, the original image takes 18 minutes to acquire. If you alter the imaging parameters, you can accelerate image acquisition to only 4.5 minutes, although you end up with a noisy image. You can then take that 4.5 minute scan and enhance it in seconds using Subtle's proprietary deep learning algorithm and provide an image that is clinically equivalent to the original 18 minute scan. The FDA agreed that Subtle Pet is able to enhance images to be clinically equivalent to the full length scan. So you can imagine the tremendous financial benefit to an imaging center if they can increase daily output by completing all of their exams at a 75% faster rate. You can scan up to four times more patients per day. Not to mention the improved patient comfort. Studies have shown that the faster we can image our patients while still maintaining high quality, the better the patient rates their satisfaction with the imaging experience. In this example, the end user accelerated acquisition time by 75%. Subtle Pet was then able to restore the image quality of this fast scan to match that of the original. So how does Subtle MR work? Subtle MR uses a deep learning algorithm to enhance noisy, lower quality scans. The software is capable of two methods of image enhancement, either denoising or super resolution. So how does it decide which to employ? Well, the DL algorithm looks at the protocol. If there is a NEX, which is multiple averages, and it's possible to denoise the image, that is the enhancement method applied. If not, the algorithm applies super resolution, which enhances the image sharpness and spatial resolution. The algorithm can apply either denoising or super resolution to brain images. At the current time, only Subtle has the FDA approved technology for super resolution. For now, only denoising is applied to spine images. FDA approval for Subtle MR is for image enhancement alone. But if the end user decides to alter the MR parameters to accelerate image acquisition, such as by undersampling case space or employing other techniques, the DL algorithm will restore these accelerated images to high quality images through either denoising or super resolution, since it knows the characteristics of the high quality input ground truth images because it was trained on these higher resolution input images. And again, deep learning algorithms have the advantage over traditional algorithms in that they continue to improve over time with additional data. The example on the left demonstrates super resolution enhancement of the brain. This is a direct enhancement with no scan time reduction. The example on the right demonstrates denoising in this knee image. In this example, the standard of care sequence on the left was acquired in six minutes. The end user then chose to alter the imaging parameters to accelerate the sequence to only three minutes and 20 seconds, resulting in a much noisier appearing image. Subtle MR deep learning enhancement was then applied to the fast sequence and restored the image quality to a point that even surpassed that of the standard of care. In this example, the standard of care image is on the left, which was then accelerated by 50% in the middle image. And then the image quality was enhanced by the DL software, even significantly beyond the standard of care quality on the image on the right in about half the amount of time. Look at the conspicuity of these small metastases and the gray-white contrast of the image on the right. Unlike the AI technology that is in development or fruition by original equipment manufacturers, subtle products can be applied to the full fleet of scanners from any vendor. They are vendor and field strength agnostic. It also works with all major sequences. So in a company as large as RadNet, where we have many hundreds of scanners from all the major vendors, vendor neutral products like Subtle become very appealing. We have found that protocol standardization across our fleet increases efficiency and also allows us to optimize our sequences across multiple sites. Subtle works with several clinical partners and leading institutions across the country, including academic institutions, hospitals, and outpatient centers. In a standard workflow, scanner images are sent via DICOM to PACS and then accessed through PACS in the reading room. When Subtle is integrated, the scanner DICOM images are sent to the HIPAA-compliant Subtle Edge platform, 
with personal health information encrypted. This is where imaging processing and enhancement occurs. The DICOM images are then sent back to PACS for the radiologist's retrieval from the reading room. Subtle Edge is a virtual machine with no hardware required. Each image is processed in 30 seconds, and each image is pushed as they are acquired, so there's essentially no impact to the final image retrieval time at the level of the reading room. Also in the image reconstruction space, GE has deep learning software which can enhance image quality with future potential application and image acceleration as well. But as of now, their software is still not FDA approved. When it does clear, the application will be limited for use on high-end GE scanners. In this example, you can see the significantly improved quality of the GEDL reconstructed image over the standard of care. Canon's FDA cleared Advanced Intelligent Clear IQ Engine, or ACE, uses a deep learning algorithm to differentiate true MR signal from noise. This DL algorithm is trained to denoise images to improve image quality by restoring low signal to noise ratio data to match the properties of high signal to noise ratio data. Look at the difference in image quality from the original image on the left and the DL enhanced image on the right. Of note, ACE is also available for devices in Canon's CT portfolio as well. This is another example of the significant gains in image quality on the ACE enhanced images. Look at the difference in the appearance of the hippocampus on the original image versus the ACE DL enhanced image. To clarify, this DL algorithm uses a denoising technique only. This is not a super resolution technique. Medic Vision's IQMR software is a machine learning tool which uses a traditional iterative image denoising algorithm for gains in image acquisition speed and quality. Since this is not a deep learning algorithm, it does not have the capability to continue to improve with additional data, but this is also a vendor agnostic tool. In this example, there is a 33% improvement in acquisition speed with maintenance of standard of care image quality. In this medic vision example, we see a 22% faster acquisition with additional improved resolution. The improved resolution is not through super resolution technique, but rather through denoising. There has been much discussion recently about the known deposition of gadolinium in the brain and other tissues following contrast enhanced MRIs. The amount of gadolinium deposited is dependent on dose concentration, repetitive contrast administration over time, and the stability of the gadolinium agent used. At the present time, there's not yet strong evidence showing definitive adverse clinical effects in the limited studies available. However, the residual presence of the gadolinium in the brain and other tissues has prompted an active movement to minimize gadolinium deposition by using the most stable gadolinium agents available on the market and administering contrast only when necessary. One new exciting byproduct of this discussion is that it's prompted the radiology community to explore artificial intelligence products utilizing deep learning algorithms to dramatically reduce the dose of gadolinium required for an exam. So SubtleGAD is directly addressing this issue by creating a DL product which can decrease the gadolinium dose to only 10% of that originally required while still remaining high image quality. This product is still in development but shows great promise. Now let's look at triage tools. Triage tools, like ADOC's Always On AI Solution, is vendor agnostic technology which works in the background scanning images immediately following acquisition, looking for critical findings like a cervical spine fracture in this particular case. When it detects a positive finding, it flags the case and prioritizes it to the top of the radiologist's work list so that the most critical cases can be interpreted first which then allows these patients to be treated earlier. In this case, ADOC has detected and flagged an acute subdural hemorrhage. MaxQAI can also detect, flag, and prioritize acute intracranial hemorrhages as is seen in this case. Zebra Medical's AI software was also able to detect, flag, and prioritize this tiny acute subdural hemorrhage. IcoBrain's deep learning algorithm not only detects acute intracranial hemorrhage, but also measures the volume of blood in the subdural, epidural, and parenchymal spaces. In addition, it quantifies the degree of cisternal compression and measures the midline shift. VizAI's product, called VizLVO, not only flags a large vessel occlusion on CT angiogram, but also alerts the entire stroke team via transmission of pertinent DICOM images through a secure mobile app to their personal cell phones, with less than six minutes from acquisition to alarm notification. Additionally, VizAI's companion tool, VizCTP, can measure perfusion in affected areas of the brain.
Quantitative volumetric MRI is another very useful AI tool that can be applied immediately following image acquisition. Quantitative volumetric MRI identifies and labels anatomic structures, then quantifies the volume of those brain structures and compares that to a large normative database. This allows for volumetric tracking to assess for rate of change of disease over time. There are two main players in the quantitative volumetric space, Cortex Labs and Icometrics, both of which have AI products that add significant value. They aid in accurate diagnosis by establishing statistical significance for age and gender match controls. These products help reduce reader subjectivity, improve accuracy, increase efficiency, and impact management. Cortex Labs has an AI product called NeuroQuan, which aids in the evaluation of patients with dementia, epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, and pediatric development. They also have Lesion Quant, which is used in the evaluation of patients with multiple sclerosis. Icometrics has a product called IcoBrain, and that's utilized in the evaluation of patients with dementia, epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, and multiple sclerosis. This is an example of how Lesion Quant demonstrates dynamic volumetric disease burden status in patients with multiple sclerosis. By identifying, color coding, counting, and providing volumetric analysis of plaques that are new, increasing, stable, or decreasing in size. IcoBrain also demonstrates dynamic volumetric disease burden status in MS patients by color coding, counting, and providing volumetric analysis of plaques that are new, enlarging, shrinking, or remaining stable. It is also possible to combine two different AI tools simultaneously on the same patient. In this example, the AI tool of quantitative volumetric MRI with NeuroQuant was combined with Subtle MR. The image on the left demonstrates color overlay segmentation by the NeuroQuant software on a standard image acquired at three minutes. The end user then chose to alter the MR parameters to accelerate image acquisition by 67%. Subtle MR then restored image quality of the fast sequence while preserving accurate segmentation. In this example, the combined AI tools of Lesion Quant and Subtle MR were applied. The image on the left demonstrates color overlay Lesion Quant segmentation of plaques in a multiple sclerosis patient acquired at standard acquisition speed. The end user then altered the MR parameters to accelerate acquisition speed by 50%. And Subtle MR then enhanced the fast scan to match the quality of the original image while preserving accurate Lesion Quant segmentation. I'd like to show you two case examples of how we can use multimodal imaging and AI products to aid in screening for a neurodementia syndrome such as Alzheimer's disease. This patient had memory loss but only mild atrophy on MRI. An FTG PET CT and FTG PET MR fusion were obtained, which were run through the AI tool of the MIM Neuroanalysis software, which calculated modestly statistically significant reduction in mesotemporal metabolism. The patient then returned five years later, and the follow-up MRI now demonstrates dramatic interval progression to moderately severe mesiotemporal atrophy. At this point, the AI tools of NeuroQuant and IcoBrain were applied, both of which demonstrated statistically significant hippocampal atrophy for age. An amyloid PET was then obtained, which was positive, confirming that this patient does indeed have Alzheimer's disease. A second patient with memory loss had moderate left temporal atrophy on MRI. The AI tools of IcoBrain and NeuroQuant were applied, both of which demonstrated statistically significant hippocampal atrophy for patient age. The patient then went on to have an amyloid study. The images on the left are the amyloid PET CT fusion and the images on the right are the amyloid PET MR fusion. There is diffuse binding of the amyloid tracer throughout the cortex and this positive amyloid study confirms that the patient does indeed have Alzheimer's disease. In our market summary discussion, we talked about a lot of AI products offering great potential to improve clinical productivity, diagnostic accuracy, quality, and safety of medical imaging. However, do they work in the real world at outside facilities that may have very different equipment than that used to train the AI algorithms? This is why it is critically important to have clinical trials to validate the claims of these FDA-cleared AI products before incorporating them into your clinical practice. So today we'll look at three clinical trials using images obtained here at RadNet aimed at validating the claims of the AI product Subtle MR. So greater than 100 brain and spine cases were collected and processed from three different RadNet centers. Abstracts were accepted to the top radiology conferences in 2019 and 2020. The first study is a blinded reader study to assess spine denoising and acceleration. 
The second study is a blinded reader study to assess brain denoising, acceleration, and resolution enhancement. And finally, the third study assesses brain denoising, acceleration, and resolution enhancement plus matched quantitative volumetric analysis in standard of care in the DL enhanced images. So the question we ask in this first study is, can we establish non-inferiority of DL enhanced spine images at greatly reduced scan times? Our abstract was titled, Deep Learning AI Technology Matches Lumbar Spine Imaging Quality at About One-Third of the Scan Time. The purpose of the study is to evaluate the performance of deep learning AI in matching routine lumbar spine MR image quality at highly reduced scan times. I'll show you some examples in our study where the standard of care image is always on the left, the accelerated image is in the middle, and the subtle enhanced accelerated image is on the right. The goal is for the subtle enhanced MR image to match the quality of the standard of care image despite significant acceleration. So we see the standard of care on the left, the fast image in the middle, and the subtle MR enhanced image on the right. In this example, you can see the conspicuity of the conus on the subtle enhanced image on the right side when compared to the standard of care. With IRB approval and patient consent, 27 patients underwent standard of care lumbar exams on one of three different clinical 1.5 Tesla scanners. All subjects underwent an additional accelerated 2D sagittal T2 weighted sequence processed by an FDA-cleared convolutional neural network-based DLAI application trained on multi-vendor MR platforms at Subtle MR. The scan time averaged was 2 minutes and 12 seconds for standard of care versus 49 seconds for the DL accelerated image. That's a 2.7 times acceleration factor. This is another example of a subtle enhanced fast scan. 54 image series were randomized and independently rated by two board-certified neuroradiologists for perceived signal-to-noise ratio, anatomy-slash-pathology conspicuity, motion artifacts, and overall image quality on a 5-point Likert scale with 1 being non-diagnostic and 5 being excellent. Two image series were utilized, the standard series and the DL process accelerated series, which were then randomized and presented pairwise side-by-side. A two-sided paired t-test was used to assess for statistical significance. In this example, you see the disc protrusion at L3-4 is just as conspicuous on the subtle enhanced image as on the standard of care. Our results show that there was no statistically significant difference between the DL accelerated scans and the standard scans for all criteria and both readers. So our conclusion was that deep learning AI technology can match routine imaging quality at up to three times scan time acceleration. So unlike the first trial where we looked at non-inferiority of the accelerated images, in this second trial the question is, can we establish superiority of the DL enhanced brain images at reduced scan times? The title of our second trial is CNN-based DL enhances perceived quality, signal to noise ratio, and resolution at approximately 30% less scan time. So the purpose was to evaluate the capability of deep learning based image processing of brain MRI to improve quality while reducing acquisition times. This is an example of a brain MRI acquired 67% faster with subtle MR but with superior image quality. For this study, 11 patients undergoing clinical brain 1.5T MRI exams underwent an additional accelerated 3D sagittal flare with an average scan time reduction of 27%. These patients had IRB approval and consent. A third set of images was created by processing the faster series with an FDA-cleared CNN-based DL algorithm, subtle MR. So you see here the significant improvement in image quality despite scan time reduction on the subtle enhanced images. The three sets including the standardized series, the accelerated series, and the DL process accelerated series, were randomized and presented pairwise side by side. The images were independently rated by three neuroradiologists for relative image sharpness, perceived signal to noise ratio, lesion slash pathology conspicuity, and overall image quality. You can see here the superior quality of the DL enhanced fast image on the right. Statistical analysis was performed. 
and again we see the superior image quality of the DL Enhanced Fast Image on the right. The paired t-test results suggested that deep learning is significantly better than standard of care for two out of the three readers with a p-value of less than 0.05. On these images, I'd like you to focus on these two little white matter foci. So on the clinical image, you can see that they're barely visible. On the fast low res image, you can now appreciate them, but the image quality is poor. And then on the DL enhanced image, Look how much more conspicuous both of these little white matter foci are, and look at this improved gray-white differentiation on this much higher quality image. When presented side by side, DL is superior, significantly superior for reader 1 and 2, and mildly superior for reader 3 for image sharpness, perceived signal-to-noise ratio, and lesion slash pathology conspicuity when compared to the standard series or the accelerated series. This is another example of the improved image quality on the fast, subtle MR enhanced image on the right. So in conclusion, CNN-based DL image processing of 3D flare brain MRI produces a boost in perceived image quality, signal to noise ratio, and resolution while providing approximate 30% reduction in scan time. In our last clinical use case study, we applied two different AI tools. Our question was, can we maintain accurate matched quantitative volumetric analysis in DL enhanced brain images at two times the speed? The title of this abstract was Deep Learning Enables Accurate Quantitative Volumetric Brain MRI with Two Times Faster Scan Times. The purpose of the study was to evaluate the accuracy of quantitative volumetric analysis in DL enhanced brain images obtained at two times the speed when compared to standard of care. 32 subjects undergoing clinical MRI exams were recruited with IRB approval. Study cohort includes cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease subjects. Two T1-weighted volumetric scans were acquired for each patient, one from routine clinical protocol and the other with half the phase encodes and scan times. The faster scans were then enhanced post-acquisition by an FDA-cleared DL software product, Subtle MR. Paired data sets were collected from five different scanners, including both 1.5 and 3T scanners from multiple vendors. Both the standard images and the DL images were processed by an FDA-cleared software product, NeuroQuant, for quantitative analysis. Results from the age-related atrophy reports were compared. Paired data sets were reviewed by a neuroradiologist to assess for accuracy of segmentation and comparative quantification results. Hippocampal occupancy score, which is a biomarker to predict the progression of neurodegenerative diseases, as well as the volume of the hippocampi, superior lateral ventricles, and inferior lateral ventricles were analyzed using linear regression and Bland-Altman plots. Our results showed excellent image quality was obtained by DL with higher perceived signal-to-noise ratio and perceived image resolution at two times faster speed. Segmentation matched between both data sets in all three planes despite significantly shortened scan time. The mean and standard deviation of hippocampal occupancy score, hippocampi, superior lateral ventricular volume, and inferior lateral ventricular volume was negligible. Scatter plots demonstrated strong correlation and linearity between the two measurements, the standard of care plus neuroquant versus deep learning plus neuroquant. Bland-Altman plots further demonstrate strong agreement between the two measures. In conclusion, this study validates the high quantification accuracy of DL accelerated scans with two times faster scan times when compared with standard. Strong agreement between the standard scan and DL process scan across each quantitative measure demonstrates the acceleration capability of DL in various neurodegenerative disease conditions. Consistent results from scans on diverse scanner types demonstrated a good generalizability of the DL software. The inherent higher signal-to-noise ratio from the DL processing could potentially improve the robustness of brain segmentation and will be the subject of further investigation. In summary, in this webinar, we discussed a broad range of AI applications in the imaging space, which positively impact quality, efficiency, and diagnostic capabilities. We also discussed the importance of clinical trials to validate the claims of these FDA-cleared AI products before incorporating them into our clinical practice. Ideal AI products save us time and enhance quality 
with seamless workflow integration. Particularly appealing products are vendor neutral and can improve over time with deep learning algorithms. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us today. Hi, everyone. So for those who uh, joined a little bit late, uh, just to reiterate, you can simply submit a question through the Zoom platform on your screen. Uh, it should be the Q&A option. So go ahead and submit any questions you have. We'll go down one by one. Um, again, I'm Anna. I'm your head of marketing here at Subtle Medical, and I'll be reading the questions. We have both Dr. Bash here. Um, and we've invited Dr. Ajit Shankaranaranian. Um, Ajit is the head of product partnerships and operations at Settle Medical. Before he joined Settle, Ajit spent 16 years at GE Healthcare as the global manager for neurology in the MR division. So thank you also for joining us, Ajit. So let's jump right into Q&A. Okay, so this first one, Dr. Bash, it says, how do you decide which AI tools to use and how do you measure their success? Ah, okay. So there are a lot of AI products in the market space to choose from. And your choice will depend a lot on the particular imaging needs and priorities of your image setting. So for example, in the inpatient setting, you may be more interested in things like triage tools, which will identify and prioritize critical findings. While in the outpatient setting, you, you may be more interested in products which will sort of impact the image reconstruction phase. But overall, in the imaging space, I think the most useful AI tools are the ones that have broad spectrum applications, including AI solutions that increase the quality of our images, the efficiency of our workflow, and the diagnostic accuracy and value of our reports. So the success of an AI tool is one that has positive impact on as many parties involved along the imaging pathway as possible. So for example, patients rank higher levels of satisfaction when their MRIs can be completed quicker, um, while still maintaining obviously high image quality. So an AI product which can aid in this would be highly desirable for patients. Radiologists want AI products that improve image quality, um, which helps us to identify subtle pathology. Now, radiologists are really only interested in AI solutions which elevate value, but without adding additional interpretation time. So we're all very busy. We want things that improve efficiency. Um, referring doctors want AI products that enhance the radiologist's report in a way that can improve diagnostic accuracy and impact management. And they also appreciate AI tools which decrease the subjectivity component of our reports. There's a lot of subjectivity that goes into our reports. We all have different styles. And so, you know, an AI products, AI products that can address that would be like, for example, through quantitative volumetric MRI. And then imaging centers are interested in AI tools which improve efficiency and impact return on investment, um, such as through aiding in billing or shorter exams, less callbacks, increase safety, and improve patient um, comfort and satisfaction. And large imaging uh, facilities such as, I work at you know, RadNet, which is the largest and, um, freestanding imaging enterprise in the United States. So we have a lot of different vendors um, in our fleet. And so uh, vendor agnostic AI tools that integrate seamlessly in the workflow are very appealing to an imaging uh, group such as ours. Great, wonderful. Um, the next one uh, is, uh, is RadNet using subtle MR? This is for Imagine. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, we are. Um, RadNet currently has three locations in New York, New Jersey, and in Southern California uh, that are enrolled in subtle MR's early access program for deployment in the first and second quarters of this year. So we are actually very excited to work with subtle. And as I mentioned in my talk, we're also involved in some blinded case uh, study trials with Subtle to assess the clinical impact of their products. And over the next year, we plan to expand our case study series, assessing the you know, economic return on investment and the improvement in workflow at our different sites. Great. Um, the third question, Susie, uh, excuse me, Dr. Bash, is uh, what other AI tools is RadNet using? Okay, so um, I'm very fortunate to work at a company that's very open-minded to um, new technology and really improving our, our care. So 
Um, we've actually been using AI products for the past 12 years at RadNet. So we started out with Cortex Lab products um, with NeuroQuant, that's a quantitative volumetric MRI tool. And we've had great you know, response from our referrers and we really felt that that has elevated the value of our reports. For the past 12 years, we've also been using uh, MIM analysis software, which is a, uh, helps us with quantitative evaluation of our pet studies. So I use it for uh, brain pets and uh, my colleagues use it for body pets. And then about three years ago, we started working with Icometrics, which is also a quantitative volumetric MRI um, and a company that has a wonderful products. Uh, we also use Medic Vision in the image reconstruction phase. And then as I mentioned, we use um, now Subtle MR as well. Uh, uh, for image reconstruction. Um, and then not too long ago, RadNet acquired an AI company called New Logic, and that's helping in various things, but in helping to, primarily right now to improve our billing process. And then we had a recent acquisition of uh, Deep Health, which was really in the, uh, focused on the medical interpretation of mammograms. And the CEO of that company will actually be leading our new AI division um, at RadNet. So we're very excited about that. Um, RadNet also uses Ezra, which is a wonderful AI company that, um, that it focuses on prostate and lung cancer screening and will eventually move to other areas of the body as well. And then some of our radiologists are also using CureMetrics, which is making great strides in breast cancer screening. In fact, sometimes their software can identify cancers that even the radiologists can't see. So that's a, a very exciting um, company as well. Great. Thanks, Dr. Bash. Um, this next one uh, is with these new technologies coming in, the appearance of the images may be slightly different than what you're used to. How do you navigate that? And what is your, mel your, your message to fellow radiologists? Okay. So my message would be not to worry about that. Any new AI tool you start using will take a little bit of adjustment, just like any new tech, any, you know, but as radiologists, we're all used to changing. I mean, the one thing that's a given in radiology is that we're constantly improving and constantly evolving. So uh, the field of radiology is actually primed to absorb new AI technology because we're all very used to that. So although the images may appear a little different at first, um, the goal is always to have clinical and diagnostic equivalents, or as we've seen in my talk, many times even better than what we're used to seeing. So we're not moving, we're, we're not going to take on any AI products that are going to move us backwards, but only ones that will move us forward in our quality. Great. That makes perfect sense. Uh, this might be a, a question more for Ajit. Uh, this person would like to know who is using Subtle MR currently. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so uh, Subtle MR, uh, th there are two phases for um, the answer, basically. One is uh, before we actually launch Subtle MR as a commercial entity. Uh, we have been partnering with our strategic partners, research partners like uh, Radnet, UCSF, UPNC, uh, Hogue Hospital, uh, to actually get uh, you know, the required data for making the Subtle MR product. Um, uh, from January onwards, we commercially launched Subtle MR, um, and we have been actually starting to do a limited launch uh, as part of our early access program at strategic number of selective centers to work closely with the sites and understand the impact in real world setting. And I think this answers a couple of other questions also. We just want to make sure that the, the robustness and the um, acceptance of Subtle MR product is there before we actually kind of widely scale it. Uh, we are currently signing up uh, interested centers for the uh, Q3 and Q4 of 2020. And these uh, site launches will uh, be based on when they receive IT approval. <clears throat> Great. Uh, question for, I guess, either of you. Well, Dr. Bash, we'll let you take this. Why wouldn't I just use the vendor's solution? Ah, okay. So it's true that several of the major vendors are now in various stages of development of different deep learning solutions. Um, that's really the trend. And uh, while that's wonderful, many of these solutions are not yet FDA approved, although I did mention one that just received FDA clearance just a week ago, um, Canon's product. But um, when these OEM solutions do receive FDA clearance, um, it's important to note that they'll really be limited for use just on that specific vendor scanners. And in many cases, only on their newer or high-end scanners. 
So the benefit of products like Subtle MR and Subtle PET is that they're scanner agnostic. So you can use them on your entire fleet of scanners, no matter what brand, and regardless of whether that particular scanner is new or old. And also, additionally, Subtle is uh, really the only company that I'm aware of that offers technology for super resolution, which allows for the flexibility of enhancing the images where denoising is not possible. Got it. Okay, uh, next question. Does Subtle MR use our data to train their model? Maybe that's a, a question for you, Ajit. That's a very good question. No, uh, um, uh, we don't use the data from your site when we are running it clinically. This, the model is actually fixed upon deployment. There is no uh, continuous learning. As somebody asked, I think one of the other questions which will come up, uh, we don't do continuous learning. We actually fix it during the deployment or when the release of the software happens. However, um, what, what we also do to continue to provide the best product as we learn from the uh, sites, we do have data sharing agreements from our, with our research sites as well as our partner sites to continue improving the model. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we are in parallel working on a newer model uh, where we have uh, specific data sharing agreements with research sites who actually provide us with the data. So, and we, um, especially at least uh, the, in the initial phases, we do plan to actually send updates uh, uh, to be deployed uh, quarterly. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, I think this might be one for you too. This says, uh, you mentioned the possibility for deep learning to improve by continued learning. Please discuss more and, and describe where the additional data for training would come from. Specifically, doesn't it come from data acquired at the end user sites? So I guess this is kind of just this, a similar question. Would you want to add anything onto that? Uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize, you know, we, we don't do continuous learning. Uh, uh, we actually do um, learn, uh, learn we, we do the learning during the um, you know, research phase and then we uh, develop the product and deploy basically. And once we are deployed, the model is fixed, the weights are fixed, so it will, uh, that doesn't change. So we are not training continuously as, as it is running at, at a specific clinical site. <clears throat> uh, for the data, we do have specific data sharing agreements, as I mentioned before, uh, with our research sites, uh, our strategic uh, research as well as partner sites, who help us actually provide the specific data which we need um, to actually improve the model. <clears throat> Great. Um, this is a question, uh, maybe Dr. Bash, is lesion quant available for C and T cord lesions? Oh yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, not yet um, that I'm aware of, so no, but doesn't mean that, that that wouldn't be something in the future. It's a, it's a great question, it's a great idea, but um, not right at this particular point in time. Okay, um, can you assess the image quality, uh, i.e. motion, uh, in homogeneity, et cetera? Um, I can take it. Um... <laughs> Anna, <laughs> so the model is specifically trained for enhancement of images so looking at the noise characteristics as well as the spatial resolution characteristics. We do not specifically uh, have not trained it for looking at inhomogeneity and uh, motion artifacts basically and I think that is a activity we could do but uh, right now the model is specifically trained for enhancement. So um, those are not um, uh, those are not the characteristics we uh, the the model will actually correct for. <clears throat> okay. Um, is Subtle MR FDA approved for children, pediatric patients? Um, yes, we don't have a specific limitation on the age range. Um, uh, we do have uh, in our training data set. We do have pediatric cases which we have included uh, from uh, multiple different vendors as well as uh, different field strength. Um, uh, obviously, I think if you go really low in the age range, uh, uh, we definitely don't have training data sets for that now, but it is not, uh, you know, we don't have a specific limitation from an age range. Um, and uh, we, we do support uh, pediatric uh, imaging. Got it. 
Um, okay, so this question, with technologists only seeing noisy images, is pathology that would normally initiate escalation and possible additional sequences being missed at scan time? Do you want to take that one, Ajit? <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I can actually take that. Yes, that is, that is the, I think, uh, the single most biggest concern in terms of uh, missing of pathology. And, uh, you know, um, I can give you a couple of, uh, there are two points to this answer. The first is, uh, you know, we have collected the training data sets from, um, from our research partners under various conditions, basically. So it does include pathology cases as well as non-pathology, you know, routine cases. Um, so that is one thing which, um, you know, the, the model has, uh, you know, uh, has been trained on. Uh, the second piece uh, one of the reasons for us to actually go slower on the initial deployments is to actually assess these kind of edge cases or the situations where uh, whether we are, whether the, um, the algorithm is missing in any of the pathology cases and what can we do to improve it, basically. That's why we want to actually do that slow rollout as, as you heard before. Um, we haven't seen uh, the algorithm missing a pathology. We haven't heard that as a feedback from our initial sites as well as the pre-launch strategic partner sites. Uh, but that is, we are always aware, uh, that's always in the back of the mind is, uh, are we missing any pathology? Um, so, so, and this is, uh, um, um, but I can actually t say, you know, till now, uh, over our eight deployments and uh, about six uh, research partner sites who have actually helped us with the piloting, um, we haven't seen it miss uh, a pathology as such uh, till now. <clears throat> and I'd like to add just one point to that, since I was uh, one of the readers for the different clinical trials, is, you know, my experience as a neuroradiologist looking at lots of uh, images, there absolutely was no loss in the conspicuity of uh, pathology. And really, there was really only a gain. So, um, I thought that the, the pathology was very easy to see and, and actually easier to see in most cases than even on the source images. So I have not experienced any problem with that. Great. Uh, this seems like a, a bit more of an open discussion question. So maybe you both can take a shot at this. It's uh, based on the number of vendors mentioned. It seems that AI for radiology is not a winner take all market. Is this true? Dr. Bash, you want to? I'll start, sure. <laughs> if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I would agree that it's not a winner take all because different AI products can be applied for different needs that you may have as an imaging facility. So um, what Subtle does well, it's not the same thing as what Cortex and Icometrics does. You know, they're filling a different niche than what you're filling. And so the bottom line is, is I think we all need to be very open to the different spectrum of AI products and assess internally what we need and what would be best for our imaging center and then just give them a try. Um, they're all different and they all help in different ways. And if they don't help, we don't want to use them. <laughs> like I said, we're all busy enough. But um, yeah, it's the, a different niche based on what the different product is. And um, the ones that we work with all add value in our opinion, in our experience. Okay. Yeah, and I, I uh, you know, I think I'll, I'll second uh, Dr. Bash's uh, comments. Uh, it is, uh, you know, different AI products have a different application, different, you know, they are actually satisfying a different needs, basically. So, um, absolutely, I think it's not going to be a winner take all, um, at least in the short term. And also one other comment is I have noticed a trend. Um, so so these, there's so many AI companies out there and they're all constantly evolving and getting better and expanding. But the trend I have noticed is for whatever area that that particular AI product is trying to address, that solution, I've noticed a trend towards sort of narrow use to more broad spectrum use. And that's a wonderful thing. So like if a product, maybe their initial rollout is identifying that acute intracranial hemorrhage, that hemorrhagic stroke, maybe their next evolution of products might be to identify the, you know, the large vessel occlusion and then their next rollout to, you know, be able to uh, find the perfusion abnormality and the mismatch. And so that is a trend that these, that this is all um, in motion and in evolution, but um, these companies are getting better and better all the time, so. Great, thanks Dr. Bash. 
we have about five minutes. I think uh, we've still got some questions left, so let's try to knock them out. Uh, the next one is, this might be for you, Ajit. How does AI, oh, well, both of you maybe. How does AI affect your workflow? Some PAX systems allow real-time interaction in the PAX viewport versus others pushing study to cloud and sending static screenshot back. Does AI speed or slow reading? Why don't you go ahead and um, start, Ajit, and then I'll add in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we have uh, done some pilots to actually just, uh, you know, look at that uh, aspect of uh, uh, introducing AI into this workflow. So, you know, one of, one of the biggest things what we want to do is not to affect the workflow. Uh, the AI processing has to happen in the background and it actually has to have enough of a turnaround time, um, you know, expectation that it does not change the workflow for the technologist or for the um, physicians on the PAC side, basically. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and we have actually modeled our um, product uh, based on that, based on that experience in terms of understanding uh, the faster turnaround times, which is needed uh, as well as, uh, once the setup is done, as uh, Dr. Bash actually mentioned in her presentation, uh, it actually is in the background. It never comes up. Uh, you know, it, it is just a push from the uh, modality to the uh, to our servers uh, processing, and then it actually the, the processed images goes back to the packs or to the scanner, whatever is needed. Uh, so, um, so I think it has not based on our experience uh, in our initial deployments, as well as. Uh, uh, the, the pilots, um, we haven't seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the end users complaining about the workflow uh, effect because of this uh, setup. Uh, so, so we, you know, uh, it's been, it's been a, as usual once the, the system has been installed and deployed. <clears throat> yes, and I have not noticed any issues with workflow either. There's sort of two different components of efficiency. You know, one is, or can we scan more patients through per, per day? And that really happens at the, you know, in the image reconstruction phase, if we can accelerate and then restore quality, um, then we can get exams done quicker. And then there's also efficiency uh, at, at the different, at the later stage for the radiologists. And again, radiologists are not going to tolerate any AI product that um, costs us more time. It really needs to either save us time or be time equivalent. And some um, AI companies have actually looked at this with clinical trials. So for example, um, Icometrics did a, it was, uh, there was a clinical trial with Icometrics where the, neuro, or the neuroradiologists either used IcoBrain to interpret um, uh, brain MRIs and MS patients and then, and then read them without the software. And they found that there was a significant time improvement and you know, much uh, improved efficiency when the Ico, uh, IcoBrain software was utilized because it just automatically calculates the volume. And when your eye is trying to track, could there be a slightly larger plaque burden or is there not, and you're looking at every individual plaque, um, that can be more time consuming. So in the quant qu uh, qu uh, quantitative volumetric sphere, there, there probably really is an impact in efficiency on the reader side for um, both uh, Cortex and Icometrics. All right, thanks Dr. Bash. Uh, the next question is different devices inherently have different nature of noises or errors which might change over time. The current model is trained on a specific data set. How do you wanna tackle these so variant shifts while using the model to denoise or super res data from different devices. You want to take that, Ajit? Yeah, and, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, as we are deploying these um, models, as we go, uh, go um, forward with our installations and everything, uh, what, we are, what we are trying to do is to get the feedback also um, in terms of what are the edge cases, what are the different things we need to improve. So um, essentially an AI algorithm, as we provide more data, more the right data, specific data, which is needed to improve that model to actually apply for a certain application, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the product will actually be more broader, more generalized uh, and more, um, more useful in different uh, settings basically. So, so I think uh, this, the, 
I would say in quote, uh, continuous learning in the sense that as we learn from our installations, from the deployments, as we hear the feedback, um, we are also lining up the data which is needed to actually improve the model. So uh, ultimately it actually will, um, uh, you know, will be dependent on how much data we can actually use, the right kind of data from the different scanners, different, uh, um, uh, 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 different field strengths to actually make the model as generalizable as possible. You know, as uh, Susie mentioned, we do have two ways to actually affect uh, image enhancement, uh, either by denoising or uh, by using the uh, super resolution method. Uh, the logic right now, what we use is by default, we actually use the denoising method if we can, uh, and if we cannot, we actually use the super resolution because super resolution is a much more harder uh, method to actually kind of implement. <clears throat> Got it. Okay, I think we can squeeze in one last question, and I believe we got them all. So good job today. <laughs> okay, let's see. <laughs> can AI measure tumor lesion volume on CT MRI, and can it measure tumor metabolic volume on PET? Thank you. Okay, so um, for tumor volume on CT, um, the problem with CT is there, we generally acquire them at five millimeter, you know, collimation. So there, there are volumetric um, uh, product applications for CT. Uh, IcoBrain has one and that, you know, measures the volume of blood in intracranial, you know, hemorrhage cases um, and cisternal compression and midline shift, as I mentioned in my talk. Um, so a future application would be also for tumor, although it would be really more applicable for MRI where we're getting the nice um, thin cuts. If we acquire the CT and thinner cuts, there's no reason why it couldn't be done with CT, but I have a feeling that um, the oncology is a low hanging fruit for future development for quantitative um, uh, MRI and CT you know, applications. Great. I think that's it. It looks like that's our last question. So I want to thank Dr. Bash for her time today. Thank you, Dr. Bash, and also Dr. Shankara Narayanan for joining us. Uh, thanks to everyone actually for making time today to join us. I know it's quite a hectic schedule out there with the current environment. So we do appreciate you joining us today. If you have additional questions, at least around um, uh, the Settle products, Settle GAD, Settle PET, Settle MR, please feel free to email info at settlemedical.com and we can follow up with you. Or if you have other questions for Dr. Bash, we can forward them along to her as well. Uh, we actually try to do these educational webinars in the Subtle Insight series once a quarter. So stay tuned for our next one. We'll keep you updated and we'll hope you join us. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.